In 1941, Charlie Chaplin made the movie The Great Dictator. 1941, America wasn't even in World War II yet. When he did this movie, it was a satire against, of course, the rise of Adolf Hitler and what was going on in Nazi Germany. And the premise of the story is that there's a Jewish um, uh, person who owns a butcher or a barbershop, and there's this dictator, and they just happen to be dead ringers for each other. And uh, you can guess what happens over the course of the movie. In this satirical comedy piece, the uh, dictator's made to look a bit more like a bungling idiot. Along the way, there's an identity switch. The dictator gets sent to prison as a Jew, and the Jewish barber ends up having to play the role of the dictator. And at the very end, he has to give this rousing speech, where in the speech, he, which he's doing against his will, he decides to undo everything the dictator has done for the last 10 years. Interesting little story, 1941. Makes you wonder how far have we come in the 80 years since that movie was made? How much progress have we had? Or is the speech still relevant today? Something he says in the middle of the speech, and I don't know if you picked up on this, but he says in the 17th chapter of the book of Luke, it says the kingdom of God is inside man. Wonderful misquotation of scripture right there, which is often what happens. We you use one little proof scripture and we throw it in there and say, therefore, we have this idea. And of course, the concept is, he's saying that Jesus taught that inside people is the ability and the power to actually change the world and do good and be good and achieve all the goodness that we really want on a global level in our economics, in our uh, way we care for the, each other, in the way that we redistribute wealth, in the way that everything happens. It's all inside everyone and Jesus taught that, which is actually not what Jesus taught. Well, kind of he taught that, but in a very different way. He didn't teach that, yes, it's inside every man, but he did teach that it can be. And in a future tense, and with the right moves, this power, this ability, this kingdom of God can be inside you. Actually, in the 17th chapter of Luke, he's talking to a group of Pharisees when he says this line. Mostly today it's translated, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's in, amongst you. Right, because you know, for Jesus, he wouldn't look at a group of Pharisees and say, oh, you got it, you understand, you got the kingdom of God inside you. Jesus was clearly saying something very different. It's interesting when we think about society and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve as a, as a people group, and we all want this easy, powerful, peaceful system that is just, system that is fair, system that works, it works financially, it works equi in, in an equitable way, there's no oppression, we want that. I had to go to the doctor's office for a checkup this week, and this sign was in, my, uh, in the doctor's office. It was hanging on the wall there. I took a little snapshot of it. It says, today is a new day, and you can start fresh with the slate clean again and begin again. Embrace kindness. Practice compassion. Stand up for justice. Talk to strangers. Ask for help. Listen with your whole heart. Offer hope. Work for the common good. Love well. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Phenomenal ideas. Hanging in my doctor's office and this inspirational quote for people to sort of realign yourself and the answer, the problem I have with this answer is, why can't we do that? Why is it we would all sit down as human beings and read this and say, of course that's the right thing. And I think we would find, no matter what nationality you are, what language you spoke, that this sort of sentiment, this concept of how we should be as people, we would all nod in agreement, yes, that's it. Why can't we do it? Over and over and over, what we prove is we can't seem to accomplish the very dream we have for how we should be as human beings upon the earth. Interesting, this last couple of weeks, I've been kind of watching the political scene, and I, I don't know about you, but I get a total kick out of the Democratic people having an inquiry with William Barr because they're saying he's corrupt because he investigated our corruption. Right, our corrupt, you're the corrupt guy who's investigating our corruption. On the whole thing goes, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel myself in the middle. I'm like, both sides, I look at you and I think, I don't think you guys know the meanings of the very ethics and words you're trying to hold on to. Either side. Right, I think that you try to hold these values you want to hold the other side accountable to, that you're not willing to play by those rules yourself. Right, so this, we have this weird state in our society where somehow these moral truths are up there and they're above us about integrity and lying and honesty and these kind of things. We, we have these values, but we can't live them out. We get mad at other people for not living them out, but we're not living them out ourselves. 
Jesus has an answer, by the way. Jesus has the answer for why it's not working, and he also has an answer for how it can work. If you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Joe, those of you at home, we're reading through the Gospel of John here, and we've been doing it for some time, so grab a Bible at home. You guys have it on your phones here. Grab a Bible here. We're going to start John, chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 15 today, and we're going to go as far as we can in this little section. It's the night of the Last Supper. Jesus is sitting around with his guys. He's got his boys at the table. He knows that he will be dead the next day. Before supper, before the sun goes down the next day, he will no longer be walking with them. He will be doing his ultimate mission, saving the world from sin. So whatever he's saying now is to them, it's this intimate thing to his immediate followers. These are not words for people on the outside. These are not words for his enemies. These are not words for people who are not part of him. These are words for people who are his devoted followers. And the next few chapters in John, those are the last things he's got to say. And he's got to cram them in these last few hours between dinner and being arrested in the garden that night. This is all he gets to say. They're still sitting at the dinner table finishing up when he says these words. And he gives the promise of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commands. A slightly better translation, the Greek's hard to translate, but if you continue in my love, you will be keeping my commands. Would have been an actual more honest way to say the, that passage right there. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, let's stop for a second and look at what he says. Let's take a a closer look. He's talking, of course, as we know on the far side of this, about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The three are one and the one are three. They think, do, and act in concert. Absolutely alike. They're three distinct persons, but they're still one triune God. In, in, In one essence, they are God. The Holy Spirit can't say or do anything Jesus wouldn't say or do. Jesus won't say or do anything the Father wouldn't say or do. They have roles within the Trinity, but they are the single God. And he's saying to them, very shortly now, the third person of the Trinity is going to come and be with you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth is what he calls him. And it's, you know, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is Jesus outside of a body is a good way to think of it. Jesus, free in spirit to be everywhere on the earth simultaneously at once. It is the personality of Jesus, the thoughts of Jesus, the words of Jesus. He is is his own distinct part of the Trinity. In this passage, he says, I will give you a helper that he may abide with you forever. And it's interesting because we don't quite have a word. I don't know what translation you have. Some of you are using, you have that translation that said, I'll give you a comforter. Some said an advocate, some a counselor, right? And so that passage, if you read different English translations, we don't have a word that captures everything Jesus said. The actual Greek word he used is paraclete. I will give you a paraclete. And what it literally means, a paraclete, literally means a come alongside person, a come alongside one. Picture yourself walking and someone comes alongside to put an arm around you and lift you and carry you and and, and come alongside you. That's literally what the word means. And in the Greek usage of it, if you looked at the way it was used, and you have to kind of go outside the New Testament, because John is the only one who uses this word in the New Testament. He uses it four times in the Gospel of John. It's not used by the other writers. So they go outside of the New Testament, and they look at ancient Greek documents, and they say, what was a paraclete? What, what did that mean when other Greek writers or Roman writers used this particular word? And what they discover is that word usually meant a legal advocate, Someone who came in like a lawyer on your behalf when you were in trouble to argue for you. Someone who could speak up for your character. Someone who could give a noble defense for you. Someone who was your advocate, your counselor. It was also used as a word sometimes that meant when you didn't know what to do or how to turn, you would bring in a paraclete who would be the counselor, the wise, wise person who knew exactly what to do to overcome a problem or do something. It was like having an expert at your, at your, on your side. 
It's interesting. So the word comforter, even helper, is a little weak. I'll give you a helper. That's a little bit weak. Like I picture a helper. I don't know what you picture. I picture being on a job site like I was when uh, Ken Edgerly and Jim came and helped me redo my garage this summer a little bit and recite it. I was the helper. That meant I stood at the bottom and handed them a board when they asked for it, right? I was the helper. It's like, you need another box of screws, and I sat and drank coffee while they did all the work. I was the helper, right? And so we pick, sometimes you picture helper. It's like, that's the weakest one you can be. Who wants that? Here, pick up the other end of the board while I do all the work and the thinking. I don't want that kind of a helper. That's not the way it should have translated. It should have been translated this advocate, this person who is smarter than you, more capable than you, knows more than you, know, more powerful than you, who will always be on your side speaking to the enemy or speaking to the friend about who you really are. That's what it meant to be an advocate. Only John uses the term. Jesus is sitting there with his guys. He's really saying, in just a few moments, in a few days, be 50 days in Pentecost, he was going to leave the earth permanently and not be there to talk to them. His physical presence would be replaced by his spiritual presence. And Jesus would talk as if this was a better deal. Because limited in his physical body, he was able to speak to and talk to who was right in front of him. But as a spirit, he could then be all over the earth talking to everybody simultaneously at once. It was going to be better for them if he went up and the Holy Spirit was released to come down. So that's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit is mentioned about 240 times in the New Testament alone. I started to do some unpacking of this, but realized I did this three years ago in a sermon on Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and the sermon was called Tongues of Fire. And you can go back in our log on our webpage, and you can look at the old sermons and find the one that I did on May 28th in 2017, and you can unpack all of the terms, all the names the Old Testament uses, or the New Testament uses for the Holy Spirit, all the ways it's described of how he works, what he does, what his jobs are, what his duties are, that kind of thing. Great one to go back and learn from. Tongues of Fire, Acts chapter 2, May 28th, 2017. So in this one, I want to unpack a few other things Jesus says. And one of the interesting things, I don't know if you picked up on this right away in the verse, but he said the world does not and cannot know him. It's interesting that he calls him the spirit of truth and then says, by the way, the world... People opposed to God in the world system, people who don't know God, who aren't willing to follow God, they don't know the spirit of truth and they cannot know the spirit of truth. I think that's kind of interesting. It's sort of like the idea that, you know, there's radio waves in this room right now. There's hundreds of songs being played in this room right now through radio waves. But if you don't have a radio and a tuner to tune in to the frequency that those songs are being played, you can't hear them, you can't be aware of them. Hundreds of songs are being played right now in this room through radio waves, but we have no ability to hear them. We have no ability to see them and understand them, know what they're talking about. And Jesus is telling his disciples that a person without God is like someone with no radio. The Spirit of God is talking, moving, doing things all the time. The Spirit of truth is speaking all the time, but they have no reception ability. They cannot see him or know him. One scholar, when I was reading and kind of prepping this passage, one scholar said that he was, it's like, if you don't know anything about art and you go to an art gallery, they're just pictures to you, right? And you have this, this blank look like, well, I like that one, I don't like that one. But you really don't understand anything about what is this depicting? How difficult is this medium to work in? Why is this one hanging on the wall for $200 million and doesn't look like a kindergartner's drawing, right? So I had an argument with some friends the other night. I said, I don't like Picasso. I'm just going to let that out there right now. I don't care for Picasso. Now, I told them, I'm not stupid. If someone gave me one, I would certainly take it. <laughs> but I do not like Picasso's art, right? But I don't, because you, you know, had this long dialogue of understanding what Picasso was doing. If you don't understand, if you don't have the meaning for it, all you just see are colors and images, but you have no grasp to understand what is this art. I remember one time being down at the Getty Museum with a friend and a group of us were there and this one girl who was in our group, she was a real, I mean, she was a really good sculptor. That was what she'd gotten her degree in. So when we walked through the art gallery, she sort of explained things to us. 
And we would get to these places and she would discuss, you know, these whole um, torsos and, of these old Roman things they had in the Getty Museum. And she would discuss how difficult it was to make marble look like it's flowing. The difficulty of that artwork is unbelievable. And it looks fluid and it looks like it's in motion, but it's solid marble. And she was discussing all the different things that happened. That's where I found out that, you know, Van Gogh's irises, which was one hanging on the wall. She says this was unique because the green that he used was the green paint. The only thing he could get his hands on was the same color as the walls of the, insta uh, uh, the insane asylum he was in, the institution he was in. And so he painted this painting of the irises and the green in it is odd and it's bizarre because it's not a really a natural green. It's the only point he could get on it was the insane asylum green. But that gave meaning to the, to the whole painting. And by the way, it sold shortly before, after that for $53 million. Van Gogh would be turning in his grave because he died a pauper. It's like looking sometimes at gardens and you can't name a single flower and you don't know anything about what the plants are. You can say it's pretty, but you don't understand it. Without the experiences, without the knowledge of art or without the knowledge of, of astronomy, looking at the stars or botany and understanding what's going on in the garden around you, it's like you can have a small, low-level appreciation, but you really don't know the deep things of what you're looking at. This is what Jesus is saying. People without the Holy Spirit of God never understand the deep truths of life, the deep moral questions, the deep meanings and purposes. They only can see the surface level and they're trying to make the most sense out of what they get, the information they have, but it never truly makes sense because they don't fully know. They cannot perceive, they cannot understand. It's interesting because every time the world starts to explore things, the world can discover facts. The world can make advances in, say, science or technology. It can make gains in medicine. It can discover facts. But whenever it comes, drifts into the moral side of things, the world system always tends to break down. We don't know what to do with the medical advances we have. We don't quite know how to use the technology in an ethical fashion. When it drifts into the moral ethics side, the world starts breaking down because it usually defaults into how do I make the most money and I don't care what it's going to cost someone else. It always devolves into greed. And so we have these odd things when the world tries to, to discover, it takes facts, yes it can learn facts and understanding, but when the Holy Spirit comes, it's something deeper, more ethical, more moral is brought into the question. It's why economic plans, yes we can discuss capitalism, but really if you look at the history of capitalism, it always devolves completely into absolute greed with a few at the top winning. So a modified capitalism is always what's worked best, trying to modify it. Socialism has always tended to devolve into actual ruin because eventually the people producing just quit and give up. And then the whole thing sort of falls apart. And so all the time there's these mediums by which we're trying to figure out why, given enough time, it always, it always devolves into something broken that needs to be repaired and fixed. Even our economic systems. I know, somebody sitting there going, what about Sweden, right? Some of you are thinking that right now. You just went, what about Sweden? Sweden is a capitalist country, my friends. Look it up and Google it. They made their profit on capitalism, and then they modified it by adding a few socialist programs because it got out of hand. Sweden is a capitalist country. So I know some of you are already thinking that, so you can Google it yourself when the sermon's over. Values, ethics, our conclusions will almost always end up being wrong, right? And sometimes even when we try to do good. I had a discussion with my wife the other day and we were watching a documentary on prohibition. She's like, what in the world made people think that was a good idea? Really, you think about, it, we're just gonna outlaw alcohol entirely and the world will be a better place. And I don't know if you know this, but more people drank during prohibition than ever before. And of course it gave rise to organized crime, um, which had not really existed before prohibition. And uh, so it actually created these greater evils. And I said, well, actually, if you go back and look at the history of the time, uh, prohibition was actually instituted out of the women's suffrage movement mostly. Because it was the women who were trapped at home who couldn't get their hands on paychecks and the paychecks were going to drunken fathers who would go off to the bars and drink away the family income and the families were suffering and the social evil of these children who were starving and couldn't get them, the women couldn't get help and the women couldn't get jobs. The women's suffrage movement was actually pushing very strongly towards the only way we can benefit the family in America is to get rid of these places where alcohol is destroying the family. That was the impetus behind it. Sounds like a good moral idea. Well, America tried that. It ended up being a bad moral idea. Why is it whenever we try to do things, they devolve? I remember in the 70s when I was a kid, 
And suddenly divorce had always been taboo. It had been something like, you just don't get divorced. You work your marriage out. You stay in the game. You, and then, of course, in the 70s, they started, it was more about, hey, you need, to, you need to be happy for yourself. And there was this phrase that would go on, the kids will be happier if the parents are happier. So if you get divorced and you're happier as a mom and you're happier as a dad, going your separate ways, that's actually better for the kids. Well, 20 years later, all the stats were in. And guess what? It was horrific on the children. The poverty, the amount of crime, most people who will end up in prison come from a single family household, right? You start looking at all the stats of the studies of the effect, the long-term effect, and this decision of our morality is to do what feels good for you. You only get one life, go do your best thing. That morality of self-indulgence uh, and self-preservation actually produced a society of severe brokenness. Why is it when we even try to do the right thing, it turns out wrong? What is it about humans that we just can't seem to get it to work? I would suggest that Jesus taught, and the Old Testament taught, even the New Testament teaches, the world's moral code is in defiance to God. So that even when it tries to do something right, it's broken. Because as it's said in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitfully wicked. The human heart is just broken. And it's broken to the point when it can't even perceive the right things to do. When it does try to do the right things, it often drifts into all of the wrong things. The world is desperate for love, but cannot fulfill love's requirements. Right? And we find this all over. It's fascinating to watch how when we try to redefine love and we try to recreate love in an image we think it would work better in, but it always breaks down. Because... We cannot perceive or understand without the spirit of truth that comes from God. It's like God had said, I have built a world that works completely. There's a system of social laws as well as physical laws. There are universal laws built into the fabric of the creation I have made. And if you just adhere to the laws, whether they be physical ones or scientific ones or you know, chemistry or, or you know, botany, zoology, all those studies, and even social laws between human beings, he's built into it ones that work the best. Anything we do which violates, undermines, destroys, or compromises the laws that he designed that are the best are the thing that we call sin. That's what sin is. It's violating God's best for you, and for the world around you, and for all of the social and the laws that are around. And we never can figure those out. We're always str struggling with it. And here's what's interesting. Even though Jesus had said the world that's out there, it doesn't know the Holy Spirit, it cannot know the Holy Spirit, it's unable to even see the Holy Spirit. Here's the issue of once we become Christians, and we start coming from a world perspective into the Jesus perspective, into the Holy Spirit perspective, the world is still in us. And we spend a long time getting rid of it and purging the world out. And Jesus had these interesting things. By the way, we call that process, the theological term for that is sanctification. Sanctification, where we're slowly over time purging out the world's view that is built into us from all of our time before knowing Jesus. Jesus would go on in John chapter 14 and he would talk about when the Holy Spirit hits you, you get adopted into his family. Look at what he says in beginning in verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Okay, whoa, let, let's look at this a second. Hold on. He begins by saying, I will not leave you as orphans. Now, we don't really have a high orphan society. We, you know, we have foster kids, and we have built a system in our society where foster kids, quite frankly, are sort of absorbed into the society. Orphanage just passed, passed away a long time ago, and we've sort of put foster kids into the system who are living in and amongst in houses and places here. So we don't really have this quite the same sense of orphan that they would have had in their culture. Their sense of orphan was more like modern day countries, like I went to Kenya once. And orphans there are a whole different ball game. They're truly abandoned and left destitute and alone. 
And literally, sometimes it would be, we had this, I was working with a group called Streets of Hope and we were building orphanages in Kenya to sort of house street boys and give them an education and try to get them so that they weren't living hand to mouth on the street. They'd live in these little gangs on the street just trying to fend for themselves, stealing, robbing, whatever they could do to get food. And it was very common to discover their stories like, how do you become an orphan? And some of them were just like, well, I just reached nine years old and the family said they couldn't feed me anymore and I, had to, I was kicked out. So they actually had parents, but they were so poor, the parents could no longer afford to even feed them. And they said, you got a shot, go out there and just live, go, don't ever come back. Sometimes they would be driven into a town and just dropped off, God and said goodbye, have a nice life. We cannot feed you anymore, you're on your own. Sometimes they would just be abandoned as little ones and they'd be picked up by, you know, this, off the street and carried to somewhere, like in our case, they would be carried in. Here's a two year old we found on the street. Sometimes, um, and at that time, AIDS was sweeping through Africa and it was destroying families right and left. And many of the old um, tribal notions were still in effect in people's minds, even though Kenya had been under British rule for 100 years. The tribal notions of Leverite marriages. If, you, if your brother died, you were obligated to marry his wife. So the men would often have multiple wives. Um, the British government, who had run the country, tried to say no, and the Kenyan government was trying to say no, no, one man, one woman, that's the way to do it, but the old tribal laws were still in effect. So imagine if your brother died of AIDS. What happens? Well, you marry the leftover wife who's got the AIDS your brother had, and now you get it, and now your wife gets it, and so for a generation of kids, mom, dad, and aunts and uncles wiped out by AIDS. And a whole generation of kids left homeless and streetless and disadvantaged. We're already on the bottom in poverty anyway. So the concept of orphans, imagine that. Imagine being nine years old and there's no longer a home to go to. There's no mom and dad to ask about how to get in life. There's no food. You have to go find your own food. You have to figure your own life out and you're nine years old. You may or not, may or, probably in many of these countries, you can't even read or write. And so at a certain point, you can't even read signs, and you have to make it, and how do you make it? You just hook up with other orphans living in the street who are a little streetwise, or they have survived. And they were treated like animals, like stray dogs by the businesses, or if they were slept, they would be kicked, they would be beaten with sticks to get out of there. They were treat, treated a lot like a stray dog. And when, so when Jesus was saying to his groups, I will not leave you as orphans, imagine what it meant in their minds. Because they fully understood that in their culture. They understood an orphan meant absolute abandonment. There is no future for you. There is no hope for you. There's no higher authority figure with resources and knowledge helping you out. None of that exists for you as an orphan. And Jesus is saying, I will not leave you as orphans. To be an orphan meant would, to have no home, to have no future, to have no sustenance, to no, have, no, have no bed. You don't have any of the things just to make it through life. You don't have any teacher, you don't have any guide, you have no resources to help you. That's what it meant to be an orphan. And everybody sitting at the table that night when Jesus said it knew what he meant. And when Jesus is saying, I will not leave you as an orphan. You are not on your own trying to figure out how to do life. You are not abandoned to your own wisdom and your own strength and your own resources. You are not alone. You are not by yourself. There is a heavenly father who brings you into his family and all of his knowledge, his skills, his wisdom, his resources are made available to you as his child to prevent you from living a life as if you were on your own. Unfortunately, there's this thing that happens in church Particularly, it hap happens a lot in America. It, it's something that our, our tribe doesn't talk about a lot, but the Pentecostal and the, um, the charismatic tribes talk about this a lot. They call it the orphan spirit. An orphan spirit means I came to Jesus a long time ago, and he's my Lord and Savior, but I have lived so long on my own, trying to figure my own life out without help, without resources, without guides, without teachers, without mentors, without people helping me, having to fight the system to get what I had, that I carry that mentality into my new Christian life. And even though I've been adopted into Jesus's family, I still think and act and believe as if I was an orphan. 
If you do a little research on the orphan spirit, you can find it all over the charismatic sides. There, I found one that just sort of is a great synopsis of describing it. It was on Intercessors for America's website. And uh, there was a personal reflection on the orphan spirit. And I, I've, I've read quite a bit on this, so this captures it quite well. There's plenty of other places you could read. But this author says, an orphan spirit drives a sense of loneliness, abandonment, and isolation. It causes us to question our standing, both in safety and in relationships with others. The breakup of the family in America has certainly fed into the operation of the orphan spirit in our country. An orphan spirit causes us to struggle with relating to our father figures, either our actual biological fathers or any authority figures, male or female, and especially our heavenly father. The enemy knows that if he can keep us from the fullness of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, we will lack the gifts, effectiveness, and blessing that God designed for us when he called himself Father to us. What fruit does the orphan spirit produce? Competition, rage, lack of self-esteem, jealousy, turmoil, insecurity, Striving to earn in our achievements and relationships, the orphan spirit can give way to addiction and self-indulgence as it seeks to find meaning and contentment. The orphan spirit robs us of right relationships that are healthy and fulfilling. Much of what drives those negative attitudes is the overarching perspective that we are not worthy. Whether it is a voice inside us that tells us that we do not measure up to others or an unmet longing to have approval or inclusion, this wrong thinking robs us of a true perspective and relationship both spiritually and interpersonally. Our reactions to situations can be skewed or disproportionate to the circumstances at hand. Look around. Finger pointing, accusation, and fear is in abundance today. This is the orphan spirit. But there is good news. We are not orphans, and we don't need to live like it. Scripture tells us this truth. What it comes down to, for many of us, is do you believe it? Do you believe when Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan? Do you believe he was lying, or he was telling the truth? And most of us say, well, of course he told the truth. It's just, I don't know that I believe it for me. But Jesus made this promise to anyone who follows him. That's what he's doing in this room with these guys. He's passing on the wisdom that needed to be passed on to anyone who would believe. These words were not for the outsiders. These words for the insiders. These were the words for who are his followers. I will not leave you as an orphan. Do you believe it or not? What would it mean to not be an orphan? It would mean you have a heavenly father who's so much smarter than you and so, has so many more resources than you, is so far ahead of you that every decision you need to make, you can consult him. That every resource you lack, he can provide. That every dream or desire you have that you go to your heavenly father and say, I really would like to do this, right? If you had a rich grandpa, would you not say, hey, could we, could we go tour Europe together if a rich grandpa could afford it? or a rich father could afford it. There'd be things you'd ask for, right? Because they wouldn't be out of reach. What if you have a heavenly father who says, ask for things, there's nothing out of my reach. What is it you want? And a lot of us go through life thinking, I have to do this by myself. I am on my own, and once in a while I ask God to give me a little dab of blessing for the work I'm doing trying to get my thing going. I'm trying to do my spiritual life, I'm trying to get my career going, I'm trying to make my relationships work, and I'm doing it the best I can, and every now and then I ask God to put a little dab of blessing on me. Right? Well, if you're thinking you have to do this on your own, you probably carry an orphan spirit. Worth examining. To not be an orphan means you have a home, a place where you belong, a place where you're adopted in, It means you have a teacher, you have a guide, you have a protector, you have a provider, resources, you have help, you have an inheritance in the family estate. How big is God's estate? Oh yeah, the whole world, the whole universe. God owns everything. 
Jesus had said, I will not leave you as orphans. And one of the weird things he says in that very passage, which, you know, he says it, and it's almost like it blows by you so fast. He says, I am, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And I, you stop with that. You look at, wait, 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 what is he saying? He's saying this to his followers. I think I, I diagrammed this out. He's saying this to his followers. I am in my Father, which is, I put a triangle. Jesus is the triune God. Or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm in my Father. So there's the Father. And Jesus is saying, I'm in him. So the next one is you see there's sort of a white outline, a little bit less, because the position of where they are and how they relate to each other, Jesus was humble and took a subservient position to the Father, even though they're equal in essence. And yet he's the same essence, he's the same color. So you see Jesus saying, I am 100% in the Father. There's no part of Jesus outside the Father. There's no part of the Father that Jesus is not in. They're all one complete essence. He goes, I am in the Father. I continually am in and with and through the food. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he'll say. And then he says this, Am, the next slide, you're in me. You're in me. Positionally, when you follow Jesus, he says, you have been pulled into me and I'm inside the Father. That means that we're all here together. In and with and through and over and under and around and behind and above and below, swimming in this great essence of this love of God. And then he adds one more piece. He says, and I'm in you. So it's like, well, Jesus, you brought me in, but you know, way deep inside my core, I'm still messed up. Jesus says, no, way deep inside your core, I'm there too. And you look at this, it's like, oh wait, he's in us, and we're un- and we're completely in God, and God and the Father, and we're in Jesus, and Jesus and the Father, and I think when you look at these, you start to realize, wait, this is the position you have with God if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Most of us think, I have one foot in Jesus, one foot out here in the world, and what I spend my life trying to do is get the rest of me into Jesus If I can get just a few things shaken off, I can get all the way into Jesus, and then I'll get the spiritual life right. Most of us actually think and operate under an idea that we are one foot in Jesus and one foot out trying to get ourselves in Jesus. And Jesus, he's saying, no, you're already in. And you even say, well, I'm in Jesus, but if you knew what was inside me, he goes, no, I'm there too. There's no shell of you hiding God and hiding Jesus from the awareness of who you are on the inside. You're positionally 100% in him, with him, through him. This is why the next thing Jesus says, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Judas was still thinking, you're going to set up a political kingdom, so how is it nobody's going to see that but us? That won't work, right? And he didn't realize Jesus isn't even going to be talking about that anymore. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Jesus was saying, back up to to that last triangle slide, Jesus was saying this, God is love. You have been pulled into Jesus inside the Father, which means you're completely immersed in the love of God. And then, just in case you didn't know if it went as deep as you wanted it to go, he says, and I'm inside you, so even to the very core of who you are. He's saying this about doing his good deeds. He's like this. Good deeds are getting wet. If you're in the swimming pool, you get wet. If you're wet, you're in the swimming pool. If you're not wet, you're probably not in the swimming pool. Do you see what he's saying about good deeds? He's not saying, get out there and prove to me how much you love me. He's saying, if you're in me and in the Father and you're in this relationship, you're showing those good deeds because they're flowing off of you, like water dripping off you when you're in the swimming pool. If you're wet, you're in the water. If you're in the water, you're wet. If you're dry, you, you might have a different concern. So many of us think, I'm still proving my love to him, by trying to obey him as hard as I can. And what he's trying to tell us is, no, the love's already there, you're already surrounded, you're already immersed in it. 
I'm purging you of your ways of thinking that you've still carried some of the world in, with you and you still have this other ways of thinking or you have an understanding that might be rooted in an orphan spirit that perceives God wrong. He says, we're rooting that out, but where you are positionally is 100% in and with and through him. The evidence that you're in and with and through him is that this love of others, these obedience to his word, naturally flows out of you. It naturally happens. And when it doesn't happen naturally and you do things that you know are in violation of his word, you feel it. The fact that you can feel the, the I don't want to call it the angst, the, the frustration, the whatever you can feel when you're out of his word, the fact that you can even feel that you're doing sin is proof you're in the swimming pool. Right, this is what he's saying to us. Faith and works, the evidence is the works. He's not saying, if you do the good works, you can be in me. He's saying, everybody who is in me naturally does the good works. The good works are the love of others and the love of God and the worship and the prayer and the desire to, to see the things that God wants to see of harmony and unity and all of these things. The, the very things that were hanging on the poster in my doctor's office that human beings can't accomplish. And Jesus said, don't worry, I'll be in you accomplishing it with you, in you, and through you. And reminding you when you're knocked off track. Because I'll be there as the desire that you have. There's two areas for us to rethink as I'm coming to a close. Two areas to rethink. If you struggle with a sin, if you're struggling with a sin, and by struggling I mean you still feel bad about it, you're already in the Father. You're in Jesus. You're okay. That struggle is part of the awareness that it's there. What's probably going on is that's, uh, there's an area of your life where you don't trust his love. You don't trust it. And you have to ask yourself, what is it I'm not trusting? Why is it I won't, I won't take this area of my life and I won't fully trust him in it. Whatever that area might be. It might be anger, which is a control issue. It might be greed, which is an issue of feeling like you're on your own, having to provide everything for yourself, security, or building an image there. It might be sexual issues, trying to figure out, well, what am I trying to find my identity in? If there's an area of your life that you're always battling a sin issue, then it's an area you don't trust Jesus in. And you got to get to why, not getting to why do I keep sinning? That's not the question. The question is why do you not trust him? What is it about Jesus that you don't trust him in that area? What are you trying to achieve for yourself that you don't trust him to provide for you? That's the question I ask. The other area to rethink is, and I think all of us carry some heart of this. You are not an orphan on your own trying to make life happen with your own skills, your own talents, and your own abilities and making the best of what you're capable of doing. You're not. You have a father who will do anything for you, who would open doors for you. You know, those of us who are dads in the room, when our kids came and they'd ask us for things, if it was within our power to open a door for a kid, one of our children who we loved, if it was within our power to grant them an opportunity to provide for them, we did it, and we're still doing it. My kids are all grown and have left the home, and we're still doing it. It's the father's heart to want to see the children rise up higher and higher than the father is. It's the father's heart to want kids to end up with a better, higher quality of life than even the father had. That's the father's heart. It's not a begrudging heart. It's a generous heart. Our limitations as dads is we're not super smart and we don't have all the resources of the universe. But you, who follow Jesus, have a super smart dad who has all the resources of the universe and it is heart to be generous to you. What is it you want? Do you even know what to ask for? Do you even know what it is you're searching for? 
Because I think oftentimes the problem with the orphan spirit is we get so locked into having done it ourselves and been our own orphan and been on our own for so long, we don't even know we're doing it anymore. We don't even know we're doing it. And it takes a step backwards to realize, oh wow, I have been a Christian for years, but I still think like an orphan. I still act like an orphan. The desires of my heart are still orphan impulses of abandonment, rejection, isolation, trying to find my place in the world. Where do I belong? Where do I fit in? You know, how do I achieve? What do I, where do I fit? It's still birthed in that orphan heart. And I think Jesus would say, rethink these two things. You are not an orphan, and why don't you trust me in that one issue? And he even goes so far, and the rest of this passage we'll unpack even more, and I don't really even have time to get to the last few verses, but over the next few chapters, he's going to unpack it even more. What he keeps unpacking is, when I said I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, it meant I'm going to give you the power and the means and everything to overcome. I will be in you. You will be in me, and I am in the Father. You're not an outsider looking in, hoping to get in. You're not banging on the glass, hoping someone will let you in. You're in. You're in. The kingdom of God, the love of God, the family of God, the power of God, the desires of God, the reach of God, the plan that God has. You're in. I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. That's what Jesus is saying to you. And that we should go, Oh man, that makes me totally relax. Wow, I got it. I got it good. Wow, I can't I can't not achieve under those terms. And Jesus is saying, "Yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you your whole Christian life." I don't know why you won't listen to me though. That's what Jesus is saying to us. I don't know about you. Those are good words. Those are really good words to sit in and just soak in, right? And if you're worried about, well, there's so many things I do wrong, you're in, you're in. Don't worry about it. You'll say, you know, just let's let's work on them one at a time, and I'll figure out why you don't trust me, why those things are distractions to you, preventing you from becoming who Jesus wants you to be and who you really want to be too. He says, let's work. We'll work on those together. But you're in. You're not earning your spot in the kingdom of God. That should be a huge relief off your shoulders. As the band comes, I want to close the service with a song. Come on up, guys. Um, I just felt it was really appropriate. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And you got to say it and say it and say it until it roots in your soul and your spirit, until it becomes knowledge and not just information. Why don't you stand with us? Thank you.
Let us pray to close. Lord, thank you for the indwelling of your spirit. Give us the fruits of that spirit this week. Your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control, that we may be the change you want to see in this world. Amen.